So I'd like to ne next bring up our next speaker, Dr. Alicia Bonaparte. I'm going to shorten my intro so we can um, make up for some time, but she's an associate professor of so sociology at Pittsburgh Co Pinsir College and trained as a medical sociologist with a specialization in reproductive health and health disparities. Um, one of the great things about planning these sorts of things is you get introduced to new scholar, scholars and potential colleagues. I'm really impressed with Dr. Bonaparte's work and um, her deep commitment and, and many areas of her life to the issue of reproductive justice. Dr. Bonaparte. I'm having to get used to having to use reading glasses, so please pardon me for a second. <laughs> it's my new thing. Hi, everybody. How are we? Doing OK? Yeah? OK. All right. Good stuff. So first of all, I want to say thank you so very much for the very kind invitation to come and talk to you all today. Can I also just say it's extremely exciting that we are engaging not only in this conversation, but also thinking in the ways of praxis. Because at the end of the day, theory is nothing unless it's put into practice. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that I'm excited about the fact that it's not just talking, but also thinking about praxis. So I don't use a clicker in my classroom, so I'm going to use this too. OK. So one of the things that I think is always important is to think about what's happening now. Many of you all are aware black women's reproductive health disparities dominates current conversations. In particular, we can think about Serena Williams fighting for and then eventually saving her own life and the innumerable cases of black women suffering unnecessary interventions during delivery, accompanied by birthing complications, as well as noting that they tend to have a lower life expectancy than their white counterparts as a whole. Yet these cases don't exist in a vacuum, and it's important to know how historical precedents set up the usage of unnecessary interventions, especially with black birthing parents. I'm gonna pause for a quick second and just say this really quickly. I'm a medical sociologist, but I'm a historical medical sociologist. So this is the reason why I always ground my talks in thinking about historical precedent, because I don't want people to think that people are being scientifically racist now and that there's no founding of that. I wanna start by talking a little bit about, about Anarka, and Dr. Bruce kind of already mentioned some of the things about Dr. Sims, so I apologize for a little bit of the overlap, but I do think it's important to talk about her story. In particular, Anarka was the patient that Dr. Bruce referred to who'd had the 30 operations on her body. And I wanna give a quote from Harriet Washington's Medical Apartheid in regards to her story. So on a June day in 1845, 17-year-old Anarka, a slave on the Westcott Plantation, just outside of Montgomery, Alabama, again, Alabama, felt the contractions that heralded the birth of her first child. Three days later, the exhausted, terrified girl writhed in excruciating labor. Sims was called in and used obstetrical forceps, with which he admitted he had little experience. The child died, and although Anarka seemed out of immediate danger, she soon faced another horrible trial. Her torn vagina began eroding, and she was left with openings between the remains of her vagina and her bladder and rectum. She was now incontinent, and the incessantly flowing urine inflamed her ravaged tissues, triggering pain, recurrent infections, and odor. As terrible as Anarka's condition was, a certain hyperbole entered Sim's description of it. He compared it to smallpox and stressed its unpleasantness for spectators, as well as the fact that it made her unfit for work. Very much so a planter's perspective, end quote. Now the reason why I mention Anarka is her story is important because it highlights the ways in which pregnancy became medicalized. And in particular, this idea that birth requires the presence of a medical doctor, and if at all possible, it needs to happen in a quote unquote safe environment of a hospital. And we can talk in Q&A about how I said safe environment. This medicalization of birth was predicated by this understanding of the pathologization of birth. And this is where you have birth is labeled as a dangerous phenomenon. So now no longer is it considered a natural occurrence, something that naturally happens, right? Instead, it's something that's dangerous. And again, it requires medical intervention to lead to a viable parent and a child. Now, I'd like you all to consider how and why black people, within clinical settings in particular, may be viewed as illegitimate actors that lack true autonomy and how this can build mistrust. This picture that you see before you is a picture of grandmother midwives. This is one of the bases of my work. Um, in particular, I study these women just because they were, in many instances, birthing workers for both black and white communities in the US South. 
And what's particularly interesting is that many of these women learn this path through an intergenerational lens, right? So their mother did it, their mother did it, their mother did it, their sister did it, their auntie, and so on, so on, and so forth. In addition to that, many of these women were, were not only known as birth workers, but they were also healers within their communities. And one of the things that excites me is they also contributed in slave rebellions as well. One of the reasons for this is because they were trusted on their plantations. And so because they were helping to birth both black and white children, right, they were able to travel from plantation to plantation. So what excites me is they're also revolutionary. Go midwives, okay. <laughs> All right, other couple of things that I just want to mention really quickly here is that, as I said, these women were the main birth workers. However, of course, as we know, the professional of medicine, largely in the latter end of the 19th century and then moving into the 20th century, they unfortunately were pushed out of birthing work, largely by doctors. So one of the first things they did is that doctors did this rounding up exercise. So what they would do is they would go into communities and they would say, who's practicing midwifery? And they'd round these women up and they'd make them dress in a particular way. They'd have to carry a particular bag that had to follow particular levels of medical protocols and things of this sort. Now, of course, at the end of the day, you would assume like, okay, so they're trying to still allow them to teach, but not really, right? Because as a matter of fact, what they did is they went to the legal profession, they said, how do we start making more and more stringent rules for medical practice? Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because, as I said before, these were the main birth workers and healers for both black and white communities. So in essence, what I would, would like to say is I would think they were presenting themselves as a vanguard of sorts, right? And so now you have these white, largely male doctors coming in and saying these women are dangerous and they're also illegitimate. And they successfully removed them, right? And one of the ways in which they did is they said that only doctors truly have authoritative knowledge. Um, when we talk about authoritative knowledge, we're largely saying that expertise is conferred upon a person based upon academic degrees, social legitimacy, and legal legitimacy. So when we think about the fact that doctors are making this argument, this claim, and saying only we can practice, it begins to make sense why this picture, right, looks this way, and then eventually you could erase this picture, and these women were no longer present in the lives of both black and white communities. The other thing that I want to mention really quickly here, too, is that during this medicalization of birth and this pathologization of birth, these two particular edicts rising in American medicine, is that you found is that black women began to be labeled as disease bringers that required either further study or elimination. And we've already touched on in regards to sterilization. Um, and for those of you who are interested, there's a concept that I want to just leave you with, and I'll let it just sit for a second. It's called race suicide. So in uh, q and I'm happy to talk about it then, but I just want to just leave it for a moment. So one of the terms that has not been mentioned just yet is the term scientific racism and iatrophobia. And I just think it's really important to make for sure that we identify terms. I'm a professor, I'm a teacher, and I think that terms are important to give context. So when we think about scientific racism, what we're largely talking about is we're talking about this levels of experimentation on black people's bodies as a means of investigative inquiry and also for white curiosity. Let me say that again. So when we think about scientific racism, what we're largely talking about is this history of experimentation on black people's bodies for the purpose of sites of investigative inquiry and also for white curiosity. But here's the thing. Racism is too simple of a term to use. And so I'm going to quote Doris Davenport really quickly. One of the things she says is, but the fact is the word racism is too simplistic. It's too general. It's too easy. You can use the word and not say that much unless the term is explained or clarified. So therefore, I discuss scientific racism as an action, and in many cases, a series of actions, right? That is learned via various social institutions, like the family, like within school environments, like within the government, pause, like the, like the healthcare system, and then it's enacted onto people of color. So since this conference is about medical distrust, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least put up some of the books that I believe were in the reference list, because I think it's important to actually see covers, because covers tell stories too. But in particular, as I said before, I use these terms investigative inquiry and white curiosity on purpose. Why? Because I think they engender an understanding of how black people are under white gazes and why such gazes tend to predominate within clinical encounters, whether intended or not. There's a philosopher by the name of George Yancey, his book is up here. His book is called Black Bodies, White Gazes, and he argues the following, quote, the black body has been historically marked, disciplined and scripted and materially, psychologically and morally invested in to ensure both white supremacy and the illusory construction of the white subject, end quote. 
Now, such narrative constructions become a part of the social landscape that black people participate within. And then when we turn to John Hoberman's work, it makes even more sense when, although he was studying white physicians, many of these white physicians still discredited the fact that they were not being racist in their clinical encounters with black patients. And yet we know that social structural variables like poverty and discrimination are largely responsible for why people experience interpersonal discrimination within clinical settings. So I mentioned earlier that doctors did this claim of authoritative knowledge, and there's a little piece of art up here in which, um, I don't know if you all can read it, but it's by an artist, her name is Abby Hirsch, and she's talking about what happens in clinical encounters when there's a degree of a, a person's loss of autonomy. So when we think about how doctors claim right authoritative knowledge, we can think for, for, for one thing. One, doctors should portray themselves as knowledgeable experts. I mean, I don't think you would trust someone, right, if they're not presenting themselves as knowledgeable. However, there's a body of research that actually shows that clinician-patient models can either prohibit or encourage patient satisfaction and compliance. Now, when I say patient satisfaction and compliance, I want to be really clear in saying something. I think the term compliance sometimes is misconstrued, right? It's this idea that you have to be obedient. And it's not about necessarily being obedient. It's more so about understanding that these particular things could lead to you feeling better. So one of the things that we find is that there's one clinician model in particular that is extremely problematic, and it's known as the activity passivity model. Just really brief, briefly, I'll just say that it looks like a very paternalistic and controlling model in which the clinician diagnoses and treats the patient with very little input from them regarding the decision-making process and other uh, potential contributing factors of illness. So these could be things like psychosocial factors, like a person's social and physical environment. Notice I distinguish between the two. Other things like family composition and also their work life. Right? So when considering the prevalence of this particular model in birthing settings, it begins to make sense why clinicians following this model push for interventions very early in the birthing process of black birthing parents. Um, looking in the state of California, quote, their rate of C-sections is on average five percentage points higher than other racial and ethnic groups. Some of the reasons for this, one, it's a faster time period to deliver a baby. It's 45 minutes for a C-section typically. Defensive medicine, so in essence you have clinicians that are afraid of lawsuits, and last but not least, there's a routinization of this form of delivery, okay? One of the things I want to mention really quickly is Mossy's work on pain management. She did this really cool study in which she talked with white physicians, and these white physicians said we're very well-meaning, and we mean well in the ways in which we treat our patients, and yet they still didn't understand that they still kept applying these old colonial tropes of assuming that black people have a higher tolerance for pain. So people weren't receiving medicine. And if you're a laboring person, it begins to make sense why you would need someone to give you adequate pain management. So this is one of the unfortunate instances that tends to happen within clinical encounters. And then sadly, what we then find is that those people with social and racial privileges have more autonomous birthing experiences and better clinical outcomes. So how do we move from racist praxis towards anti-racist praxis in maternal health care? I want to talk really quickly about one of my sheroes. Her name is Jenny Joseph. But in particular, one of the crucial ways I think we can think about praxis is situation-specific interventions, and in this case, the utilization of community health workers. Now, Dr. Bruce was kind enough to kind of tell us already who these people are, but I want to mention really quickly is that in some literature, you'll see that these people are described as cultural brokers. And the reason why is that they tend to share similar racial, class, and gender backgrounds as those vulnerable communities that are receiving health care. So this is the reason why they're pivotal. In addition to that, one of the main cruxes of their work is to eradicate health disparities as mediators between practitioners and patients within these vulnerable populations. Now, because CHWs work to encourage patient autonomy and health literacy, and when they're welcomed by clinicians, because this is a key component as well, they foster what's known as this mutual participation model. Now, this is a model that I tend to champion a lot when I teach my students. And one of the reasons why is that this is a model where both clinicians and patients have equal power in the decision-making process. Now, there's another model that's referred to the guidance cooperation model. It's slightly different. It doesn't mean that patients don't have power, but what you find is the clinician kind of serves more as a guide in regards to the decision-making process. So there's still some input from the patient, but slightly different. Again, as I said, heralding Jenny Joseph and her work, she has an amazing uh, community birth center called The Birthplace. It's located in Central Florida. What's interesting about Central Florida, it's a tri-state area that she serves. This is an area that is known for clinician shortages and has some of the worst maternal and infant health outcomes among women of color, primarily black and Latino women. But underneath her direction, CHWs are a huge part of what she refers to as the JJ way. 
What's interesting about the JJ way is that it centralizes agency and empowerment of the birthing parent. I don't want to pause for a second and say uh, very explicitly. The reason why I use the term birthing parent is because um, I'll show you the book a little bit later on. But in my in my co-edited volume, we actually have a chapter written by a trans man talking about his pregnancy experience. And so I think we just need to be mindful about inclusive language that we use about people who have birthing experiences. So I just wanted to make sure I was clear about that. So in particular, when we think about this centralizing agency and empowerment of the birthing parent, one of the ways in which she does this is that she increases access to care, practitioners, support, education, and what she quote unquote calls whatever else is necessary for the baby to reach full term in the form of partnerships between the birthing parent, their families, communities, and practitioners. One of the ways in which she does this is that she utilizes the uh, concept called trauma-enforced care. So this is a recognition of the fact that many of these individuals who are coming into this place have suffered a, lo a large amount of what we refer to in sociology as cumulative violences. I think sometimes we think about violence as something that always has to be something physical. But we can also think about violence as a structural thing. So I live in a community in which there's not a large amount of funding that comes into my community so that I can have good air. I live in a community in which my water, Flint, right, is still bad for me. It's still, in, it's still infecting me and my children. And, right, and we know it's going to have long-standing effects. So these kinds of things. So recognizing these types of structural barriers that people face right, when they come into the room. The community strategies that I'm going to, sorry, the communication strategies that I'm going to talk about outline a couple of concepts that I want to make sure that I mention. The first of which is known as therapeutic communication. This is something that um, I know medical schools are starting to get better about, but I want to challenge them to get better. You need to get better, you need to get better. And in particular, when I say this, is what we find is within therapeutic communication, this is where we're asking for clinical interactions that prioritize autonomy, beneficence, so doing something in the goodwill of the patient, not about your ego. And last but not least, it's also about fostering support and rapport, as well as this concept of narrative medicine. And this is a technique that allows patients to tell their story and their experiences, and this aids in treatment guidelines. And then last but not least is the concept of cultural humility, which is a refutation against the idea of cultural competence, because you can really, can you really become competent in someone's culture? No. But instead, what you can do is that you can be self-reflexive. And it's a recognition that you may not be familiar with someone's cultural practices, but you are open to learning and incorporating those into clinical encounters. Additionally, I think that some of the things that Jenny Joseph and her team does <clears throat> incorporates black feminist sociology. So one of the things that I think about is I say, hey, this is a black feminist sociology and the clinical toolkit. One, we know that black feminist sociology, it centers the lives of black women. And in particular, what I'm asking and what I'm suggesting for you to see is the JDA does this within its clinical encounters. There's a couple of steps that I want to talk about really quickly. The first happens this way. Birthing parents are given practical suggestions and their own mini health chart. Jenny Joseph refers to this as a prenatal passport card, which can be taken to all doctor visits, whether they come to her clinic or someone else's. Why is this useful? It heralds autonomy. Two, each birthing parent is greeted warmly each time they come to a clinic by a team member, which reflects accessibility and connection. The first visit always involves a prenatal exam and establishing their birthing site. No woman is turned away. No birthing parent is turned away when they come there. And each visit also involves an educational format in the waiting room in which they use peer educators, aka CHWs, with an additional focus on postpartum care, breastfeeding, and family planning information. This heralds patient compliance and satisfaction. Staff are integral to all birthing parents, including case management and recognition of which staff member has better connections with the birthing parent. So again, right, what does that do? It heralds retention and a continuation of care. And then last but not least, she also does gap management care. And this is where she addresses barriers and they create solutions that are client specific. Again, recognizing the chronic stressors of black birthing parents' lives and how they can be mediated with good health care to have a safe and happy birth for parent and child. So I want to conclude by saying the following. I think it's important to uh, reduce black people's fears of medical encounters. It requires being self-reflexive of implicit bias and engaging better clinical practice. And I want to encourage you to kind of think about the JJ way as a model, and in particular, a model about how and why you can become a better clinician. And it allows you all as providers to truly follow the oath of doing no harm, but rather being in service to your patients. A couple of quick statistics. According to what Jenny Joseph has been able to do, African-American and black women who received care from the Easy Access Clinic had better low birth 
weight outcomes, 8.6%, than individuals of the same race in Orange County. That's not Orange County here, that's Orange County there. And in the state of uh, Florida, which was 13.2% respectively. African American and black women who generally have the worst birth outcomes locally, statewide, and across the country who received the JJ Way had lower preterm birth rates, 8.6% than individuals of the same race in Orange County, which was 13%, the state of Florida, which is 13.3%, and the nation, 13%. So I'd like to end with a small plug. If you're interested in learning more about elements of praxis, I have a co-edited volume with uh, my colleague, Julia Chinuri Opari. And in that book, we not only historicize the experiences of women of color within um, clinical encounters and maternal health care, we also conclude with actual practice guidelines. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. transitioning from the reading classes to my own eyes. <laughs> so that was pretty awesome. Thank um, you. <laughs> that, that, I'm really excited about this um, approach. And as working at a dominant institution where cultures are grounded regularly, mm -hmm. um, one of the questions, because we are charged with training uh, residents and physicians and medical students, how do you begin to integrate this sort of um, disruptive idea about how you treat your patients in a dominant culture educational institution? So you know what's really funny? One of my s former students has been trying her hardest to get me to come to her medical school <laughs> currently to talk about this, so I appreciate your question a lot. Um, how do I say this? I remember I said the midwives were very revolutionary, and I take note from the ways in which they were able to do that. They weren't forceful in the ways in which they did it. Um, it's kind of like that saying where they said water has no enemy, right? Water can get through almost anything. And I think, how do I say this? Yeah, I think that one, it's important to see how these models can work effectively. Uh, Columbia University actually utilizes narrative medicine. They actually have a training program. And I think having um, visitors from that program potentially come to your institution to kind of show this is how we do what we do. I want to go back to a comment that was made earlier, though, and I do think it's important to acknowledge that teaching empathy is very, very difficult. And when I, and I had a conversation with the person who had, who, had, who had posed this comment, and again, I also expressed to them I appreciated the comment, because I think at the end of the day, even if you don't have empathy, you can still do good practice. Do you all hear what I'm saying? Like, right, okay. Even if you don't have empathy, you can still do good practice. And even if that means you have to be regimented, what does that mean? You're doing no harm and your patients are getting better care. So I think that's one of the first ways in which we can think about it. I think also, I personally think that medical school, medical school needs to be revolutionized. I really, really do, because I think you have to, I teach my students that there's a social reproduction of class that happens within medical schools. So you have the same people entering into medical schools, and then those same people become administrators and CEOs and directors and things of that sort, and then they only want to collect everybody else who looks like them and makes them familiar. And I think at the end of the day, this is why I keep stressing this point of being self-reflexive. If you cannot be self-reflexive, then you probably shouldn't be in your position of power. Slight technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I love you. <laughs> Not because you gave me a shout out, but I just love your presentation. So here's my next question. And I'm sorry I'm a Debbie Downer. I've heard the presentations and I see that there's a lot of connections with history and what we're currently dealing with, right? Um, in your presentation, you mentioned how black women were viewed as disease givers, right? Disease bringers. Mm -hmm. Bringers, sorry. There is an issue with black and Latino men and HIV infection rates mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Black men are impacted by HIV at high rates. Yes. Is there data or research studies that show the mistrust that providers have of the vulnerable populations they serve? Mm -hmm. So is there a correlation between the mistrust that providers might have or the prejudice or racism they have of, of, of black men in this practice to see if there's a correlation between HIV infection rates or lack of treatment adherence mm 
it almost sometimes I feel like, once again, the burden is put on agencies and community providers, like we're doing something wrong, mm -hmm. like our funding gets cut because we're not reaching numbers or we're not reaching the goal. But how much of this lack of treatment adherence or how much of this infection rate amongst black men is due to the mistrust that providers have of black men? So here's the interesting thing, like I would say that those studies are very difficult because clinicians are not very forthcoming. Um, if we think about the purpose of an m and conference, for example, right, like this is a private setting in which you talk about some of the medical mistakes that may have potentially been made and things of that sort, those are closed meetings. The general public is not allowed, to, right, the, the ability to be able to go in. With that same vein, many clinicians don't want to talk about this because again, that requires placing a mirror in front of them. I think the other thing that's important to consider here too is, and this is why I'm also an interdisciplinary scholar, I think it's important to look at the ways in which, before we even get to like, that they have the distrust of that person with that condition, let's just start with the fact that they have distrust of people of, of color. I teach a class called African American Social Theory. In that class, I talk about the precedent of why we have these tropes associated with people of color, right? So these ideas that black people and people who are Latinx are pathologically and morally inferior to white people, right? So these types of ideas are embedded in very subtle but very pointed ways in our day-to-day -day lives. So if you already have that messaging happen, when you get to the point where the person is now practicing medicine, I'm not gonna say it's too late, but now it requires even deeper work. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Um, my area of specialty is unfortunately not HIV, but one of the things I can say really quickly is I was just teaching in my medical sociology class my students, and we were doing an article and talking about trust between partners as it relates to HIV transmission among um, Latin, Latina women in Florida, right? It was a study we were reading. And the students were talking to me and they were like, wow, there's these elements of culture that people don't understand as well. And this is the reason why I use the term cultural humility and not cultural competency. So again, right, I think we have to understand and recognize, right, that the cultural competency is a term that makes many white people feel comfortable. Let's just be honest, right? So it's like, I am now culturally competent because I speak Spanish and I know what marianismo means and I know what machismo means and like, no, like, you know a term. Um, I was recently at a conference and I said, you know, I'm tired of people using the term woke just because you read a book, or just because you use a term. Like, that doesn't mean you, you know what you're doing. Does that make sense what I'm saying? And I apologize, I didn't fully answer your question, but I wanted to at least be honest. Hi there, doctor. Oh, yeah, I'm over here. Okay. Hi, thank you so much. That presentation was phenomenal. Um, you said to come back to you to speak about race suicide. Yes. Could okay. you explain that? Yes. So um, for those of you who are public health majors, scholars, or things of that sort, I'm hoping that you learned this, but if you didn't, here I go. So um, in the early 20th century, doctors started becoming very concerned with maternal and infant mortality rates, but they were really more so concerned with white women's maternal mortality rates and white infant mortality rates. And so they said, okay, we have to engage in a public health campaign in which we have to change some things because we are fearful of race suicide. In essence, that the white race is going to die out. And so when we think about these public health campaigns, they're lauded as these amazing and wonderful things, right? It's like, look at this history of public health advocacy in the United States. But when we see that it was race specific, we begin to understand, right, that it was really about protecting one particular group of individuals. And on the, on the flip side of this, what was also intriguing is they were also afraid, ready for this part? They were afraid because there were rising birth rates among black people. And so they were like, wait a minute, the white women are dying and the white babies are dying, but these black people keep producing more and more and more children. Something's not right with this. So again, we're fearful of dying as a race. So that's what that term is about. Yeah, it's deep, right? Yeah. <laughs>